you know, going through uh, our first feature film, um, one of the things that was the most important was finding locations before writing the script. And I think that was a huge deal because, say, a lot of times you just want to write a script with, you know, any locations in mind because you want to, that creativity just to flow. But then when you go after you're writing the script and go find the locations, you might have thought, oh, it'll be easy to find, you know, some school that will donate their weekends or, or something. And you're not anticipating that, oh, you finally go to ask, you know, you, you're going to sweet talk the principal uh, and they're like, oh, yeah, no, it's a thousand dollars a day, you know, and you just had no idea that that was going to be part of the cost. Uh, so I think it was important, you know, when you're about to write a script to go, oh, well, you know, my mom has a beach house and my uncle owns a grocery store and, you know, uh, so-and-so has a plot of land and you find all these free locations or cheap locations and then you go from there and you write a script around those locations. That will minimize your cost dramatically. When working with... 13 days and like $8,000, you are talking about just a few hundred dollars a day that you have for, for everything you're doing. And so you're, you're not, you don't have time to like do pickups. You don't have time to, you know, try to set up a shot once you get there. You need to make sure you know exactly what you're going to be doing that day. Um, so when we got to, when I got to finishing the script, you know, I'm an illustrator. That's what I did for a long time, comic books and children's books. And I did storyboards for movies. And I, I saw the importance of getting the storyboards down so that you, when you get to, to the set, you're not wasting time. So I storyboarded the entire script from, you know, the very first shot to the very last shot. And I knew it was going to be important, but I didn't realize how important it was till once we got there. So my first AD, Aria Mickenberg, was able to open up the book, look at the shot we needed, and say, we need this shot. And we go, okay, let's set up the shot. Dan, our DP, sets the shot up, sets the lights up, shoots it. We, we do a red circle around that. What's the next shot? Here's the next shot right here, right in front of us, because we have the storyboard scripted, uh, I mean, illustrated. And... That was far and above a huge important piece of the puzzle to get the movie done in time on budget um, and and finished without having to go back and go, oh, we, we totally forgot this shot. Now we have to find the location again and find the actors again and set up this time. We didn't have to do that because we looked at the script. We looked at the storyboards and we had finished it all. Uh, I didn't expect to walk into the first meeting of the film and immediately know what the film was going to look like in the end, which was very important. And now that I'm editing the film, uh, I don't really know what I would have done without it because every time I go into a scene, the first thing I do is I look at all the storyboards to get a feeling for what Joe wants out of the scene. And knowing that, having that backbone, that structure allows me to kind of branch off of it and to build off of it and to be more creative because I can allocate more of my mind and more of my time to, to the little details as opposed to the backbone structure. I think the storyboards were one of the most important parts of making sure this film got made on time. I mean, we shot 90 pages in 13 days, which was kind of insane. And I just remember the first time we had the, or we were presented with storyboards, I looked at this and said, this is going to make my job a million times easier. I mean, the movie was basically already made, and all, all we had to do was just get in there and actually shoot it. And even though we did change up a few things here or there, at least we still had the foundation of everything already built, so I was able to see exactly what Joe wanted to make, and that made everybody's life a hundred times easier. I think that when you're shooting a film for under 10,000, at least the, the way we did, um, bartering and, and just, and just sweet talking, being nice and like, uh, gaining relationships with people is like number one, because you're not going to be able to, to, to pay everybody or pay very many people at all or anybody. And so you have to learn to say like, what are my, 
um, aspects or what are my talents that I can give to other people that I can trade with people. Like I'm an artist, I'm an illustrator, so I was able to like barter my illustration skills for other people's skills. For me, and this is one of the ways that I approach this movie with Joe was, I've been on a few sets before where the directors and ADs would get together and they'd say, okay, we only have X amount of hours left. What scenes are we gonna cut? And that is something with this movie I did not wanna do at all. When I sat down and we went through the storyboards, I went through the script with Joe, a lot of it, I mean, 99% of it was almost pivotal of, of what he wanted. And I said, okay, I wanna make sure I'm getting whatever his vision is, I am shooting it. I am making sure we get that done. So, and I don't say this happens all the time, but for this, efficiency was greater than creativity. And not that you shouldn't have both together, but making sure that we got everything we needed to do that day, that we need a wide, we need medium close-ups. If this is it, we do one take, we do two take max on just about everything in the movie. Um, how do we make sure we are not missing anything? So I make sure Joe is getting his full vision out there. Then when we have time, okay, great, we finished this scene and I still have 20 minutes left. What's a creative angle? What else can we do to enhance what we already have? Because regardless of whether or not we get more creative with it, we can still tell a story. And at the end of the day, if you haven't shot something, if you spent an hour critiquing a shot, trying to move a sandwich one specific way or, you know, fine tune the details within a shot, you may not get the shot off and you may be sacrificing other shots which are more important, but you won't know that until you're in post. So making sure we get everything to me was what's most important. That's kind of how I, had, or how I looked at this. A huge thing as a creator is that you create a, this piece of art and you, you feel like this is un, unchangeable. Like, this is exactly what you envisioned. But when you're working on a small budget with a voluntary cast and crew, like, you don't have the, the, the luxury of that kind of rigid idea. If you were working a $500 million budget, sure, do it all day long. But when you want well, under $10,000, whatever you've got, uh, a no-budget film, you've got to be willing to make compromises uh, to, to fit in the time constraints, to fit in the money. And so um, writing the script, there was a lot of things I had, to, I had to, after writing the script, look back and go, there's not enough time for this, there's not enough money for this. We're gonna have to change the script and be able to, to work on the fly and changing the script. And it, if you're a good enough artist and, and a creative enough, you'll be able to do that, you know? And that just t tests your merit as, as an artist. And there was a lot of things on set that we had to on the fly go, there's no way we can get this shot. Like there was one shot we wanted, I wanted a real high aerial shot um, inside, of the, uh, inside of a warehouse. It was gonna be this nice like uh, bird's eye view of, of this control room. And then once we got there, realized there's no way we could do this and we don't have enough time to set up the shot anyway. And so then we got another shot. We just set up a ladder and we shot as high as we could and it looked really great. And so you have to be willing to make changes on this kind of a set. I think the biggest thing for, a biggest tip for writing a script when you're on a very low budget is I wrote the script with one main character, one main actress, and everyone else was supporting roles. That way, I had one actor that had to commit the entire time, and everyone else only needed to commit to one or two days. And that worked out great because it reduced your, uh, you, it reduced your budget, because you didn't have to feed as many people, you didn't have to, to pay as many people, all that sort of thing. I just needed our main actress Linnea to commit to the whole time, and and it's hard to ask a bunch of people to commit, the you know for 12, 13, 14 days uh, of their life, but it's really easy to ask somebody to commit to one or two days. Almost anybody will do that. So, working on a low budget film, we're dealing with a very small crew. Uh, and everyone is serving multiple roles. The director himself, he was directing, he was doing wardrobe, he was, he was doing food, he was 
doing all sorts of things. I myself, I, I worked uh, AC, gaffing, sound, uh, boom pole operating, uh, and also acted in one of the scenes of the film. And it's, it's important to be flexible in what you're willing to do on a low budget film because really that's what everybody's doing. We're all working together to try to make a full feature in a very limited amount of time. Well, I think for your main characters, the ones that are going to have a lot of speaking time, you need to find people that are gonna memorize their lines beforehand. Uh, when you deal with theater, everyone needs to have their lines memorized. There's no mistakes you're gonna be in front of a live audience. When you're dealing with movies, a lot of people are like, oh, I'll learn my lines you know, right before we get started. Um, but when you're on a small budget, uh, time is money, like, in incredibly. So you can't waste any time. You only have, you know, five hours in this one location. Everybody better know their lines. So it is extremely important to do, I'd say, do as much prep work as possible. Prep work, number one. Do table reads. Make sure everyone sits down and you can tell if they know their lines or not. And if they don't, you need to take them aside and say, memorize those lines before we get on set. Because if not, we're not going to get this movie made. Feeding people is number one. If you don't feed people, they're not happy. You know, I made sure that like some of the cast and crew had certain dietary needs. I made sure that those dietary needs were met. You know, some people were vegetarians. Some people um, couldn't eat, you know, gluten or something. I tried to make sure as much as possible to have foods that they could eat on set. I, I, when I first started, I was going to, like, we planned out meals with my mom and my sister because they were helping out uh, behind the scenes. And they were going to cook every day. And then what, logistically, once we got down to doing it, it was just not going to happen because things just get crazy. Um, so I found a grocery store that that basically does like catered food every day that has it out, you know, for you just to pick up, you know, sushi and sandwiches and pizza and all sorts of, uh, fr you know, fruit trays and veggie trays. And so I felt like that was easy. Uh, hand like just little hand foods that they can pick up. People can eat while they work. I think one of the essentials of being uh, working in a collaborative environment is to be nice. You know, um, there's plenty of people that that are hard noses when they're you know trying to collaborate with people so they can get their art just right, and that's great. Maybe that maybe they make better art, but that's not somebody I want to be and. The thing is, is when you're working on a small budget, that's not something you can afford to be. Because you could make that first film with only a few thousand dollars, and maybe you get enough people to work with it. You'll never have those people want to work with you ever again. And you might not ever be able to make another movie again. So being nice is, is huge. And also being willing, when, you're, when you are nice, you also have to be willing to collaborate being willing to make changes because you're working with a bunch of other artists you're not working with a bunch of other worker drones you're working with a bunch of other people that are artists as well and they want to insert their art into what you're doing so yeah you have to be nice you have to also just be i think just being a nice person is huge L looking out for the for the um emotions of others not just kind of railroading everyone to get your way so yeah being nice is huge and a lot of people would say uh you ever have everybody bring their wardrobe and that's something you can do but i think that's kind of a thing that a lot of independent films are doing right now and everything kind of like looks all the same and so one thing we decided to do was see what resources we had in the local community. I have a friend that owns a thrift store that owns lit, uh, like kind of a vintage clothing store. So I went to her and I said, can we rent out clothes? And she let us use her place as kind of a dressing room. We had a bunch of the actors come. We found the clothes uh, that, that looked cool on them. And, and we 
and we actually had kind of like something that a lot of small budget uh, films don't have. We set it ourselves apart by having a, like vintage clothing, which looks really cool on camera. And when we went to props, you know, eBay, Amazon, those were huge. We had a whole uh, like costume party. And I went to eBay and went to Amazon and just found the cheapest masks that look cool still. And so we, we were able to dress everybody for like about, you know, five to ten dollars a person. And it all looked like cool costumes, looked like fun costumes. And, uh, and so I think it's important to, to look at like Craigslist, look at Amazon, look at eBay. You can find all sorts of cool stuff if you dig enough. If you sit down and spend a couple days digging through the internet, you can find cheap stuff and it'll raise your production value with little money. From a, a DP standpoint, the one thing that I wanted to do with this, knowing that we only had 13 days to do 90 pages, was the simple rule of KISS. Keep it simple, stupid to where, how do I shoot this as simple as possible? I mean, I lit the entire movie with two one by LEDs, and that was it. Um, walk into a room, you open a window, you turn on a practical and say, great, how does this fit the scene? Do we need it more moody? Do we need a little more ambience? And you just accent from there. And it really helps doing that because you don't have to worry about moving in tons of lights or worrying about different grip trucks. And it would have been nice to have more equipment, to do different things, but there is no way we would have been able to move as quickly as we did with the amount of people that we had. We were limited to, I had one AC, and there was one guy in sound who also kind of acted as an AC. So having everyone be as flexible as possible, you, you just don't have the time to move all kinds of lights, to do different things, and using what you have is probably the most important thing you can do as a DP, not having to rely on, oh, I need this light, this is my favorite setup, this is my favorite this, what do you have in front of you? Make it work. I believe in low budget magic. I think that a lot of films benefit heavily from having a lower budget because it forces all the people working on the film to be more creative. Like it forces the, it forces the, uh, the cinematographer to f try to find creative ways of telling a story efficiently. It forces the editor and myself to try to piece together this thing in a way that, that is interesting and rhythmic, but with very with a small amount of tools. So it, it definitely makes for a more creative and rewarding experience. Shooting in 4K was something we knew we absolutely had to do because there were a lot of scenes that required push-ins, that required dolly slides and whatnot. And we did not have the time to set up any of this. I mean, there was one specific scene that is almost three and a half minutes of a slow push-in that goes from a medium wide to a close-up on Linnea's face. And the only way to do that consistently is either having some kind of motion tracker with someone who is amazing pulling focus, uh, using a camera with autofocus, which we didn't have, or doing it in post. And that's really what we did for a lot of this was we shoot wide, we push in and post because we know we're going for a 1080p uh, master. So we have that flexibility to re move the image around, to reframe, to do the push-ins. We just wouldn't have been able to finish the movie on time had we had to move around all this equipment. So shooting in 4K and editing in 1080 really made a major difference in the effectiveness of, of what we got done. One of the most important things I think you can also do is find people that you've worked with in the past that you know you can work with efficiently. And this is, I had Alex and Joseph working with me just about every single day of the 13 days. And I'd worked with them for years in the past, just through different gigs, through weddings, interviews, you know, documentary work, whatever. We have a workflow to where we know we need to swap a lens, this grab, you know, this person grabs a lens, this person does this, this person does this, and there's a workflow of instead of taking an extra minute to get here, you're shaving a minute off of everything you do or 30 seconds off of everything you do, that adds up at the end of the day and you may have saved 20 minutes at the end of the day, which means we could have had an extra 20 minutes to get this shot to finish this scene, which we wouldn't have had had there not been that working relationship there. I know a lot of people are always wanting to shoot on the latest, the greatest equipment, the newest things. How do we get this? How do we get that? And 
for us, this really came down to what equipment do we have? Um, how are we gonna work with what we have? Now, I have an FS7 and the Sigma Art Lens package that I use for just about everything through my own personal work. So instead of worrying about trying to go through and get a RED, get an Alexa, you know, go 6K, go 8K, it was no, what do we have available? We only have $8,000. And I think Joe said 4,000 of that went to food, which does not leave a lot for everything else. And realistically, there are more important things. Wardrobe is more important than your camera. Making sure you have food is more important than your camera. So learning to work with what you have, even if you don't have your own camera, find someone that has one you can use. They're going to be people who just want to create. And finding those people, bring them onto your project, regardless of what they're doing, uh, is, is a great way you build more relationships and you're able just to create things you may not have been able to create before. Looking for cheaper ways to do something isn't necessarily always a bad thing. I, I know one of the things that Joe really wanted to do was reference the movie Suspiria in um, the visual style of how we shot this. And there are so many colored lights. There are gels on everything. I mean, the movie is basically yellow, red, green, blue on every single shot. And we just did not have the amount of lights to do that. So what I did was we found some super cheap gels off of Amazon for like 12 bucks cut them into little squares and just stuck them onto the front of the lens. So we had a consistent color throughout that we would not have been able to do it any other way without paying 80, 100 bucks for a filter to go in front of here or gelling something for hundreds of more dollars, which we just did not have. So there's always a way to do it cheaper. And that doesn't always mean it's bad. Yeah, I may have lost a little bit of clarity because we're putting crappy plastic in front of the lens, but it worked for the scene. One of the most important things for me on this film was doing it efficiently. And the most helpful thing other than weddings was I was able to DP the year before this a murder mystery kind of recreation show. So basically the way this worked, I would show up to set, the director would hand us a script and say, great, we have 12 hours, here are 40 scenes, let's shoot. I mean, locations I'd never seen before, uh, actors I'd never worked with, scripts that I had no idea what we were doing. And doing that for such an extended period of time kind of builds your mind where you get to a place, you walk into a room and you're placing cameras. You know, you walk into the grocery store, you walk into your bedroom, you like, I'm going to shoot this scene this way, even, even if there's no scene. So you basically get to a point where you're living your life as if you are creating a movie. And I think that's one of the most important parts for always being able to continue to be creative because every new room you walk into is a new set for you. So if you look at it that way, you're always making movies.